If you look at say, the formation of a solar system, what is it that you know gives a solar system say, a hospitable planet? When you look at the formation of solar systems in the sky, is there something else that's key for a planet that might be able to sustain life like Earth? Hello and welcome to The Purposeful Lab, a podcast brought to you by the Magis Center. I'm Katherine Hadro, and once again, joined by the one and only Dr. Dan Keebler. Thanks for being back here in Washington, D.C. Great to be back here with you, Catherine, and ready to have our first interview today. I know. Episode two, our first interview, our first guest. I'm really excited to speak with Dr. Karen Oberg, and you you know her personally. Yeah, I've gotten to know uh, Karen over the last uh, couple of years. We've uh, uh, spoken together at uh, different conferences and uh, have done seminars um, for uh, like high school teachers um, uh, together. And uh, she's really an interesting uh, person because uh, she's really interested in these issues at the intersection of science, theology and philosophy, thinks about these big questions. Um, and then her scientific research, um, which uh, we uh, I'm looking forward to talking uh, with her yes. about, it sort of it, it bridges physics, chemistry, and and right up to the origin of life. So she she bridges a lot of different disciplines. So it's it's, it's going to be a fascinating conversation, I imagine. No, absolutely. And she herself has a very interesting personal story, which I'm hoping to ask her about as well if if there's time. Um, so just so our listeners and viewers are aware, Dr. Karn Oberg is a professor of astronomy at Harvard University. So highly esteemed, right. very impressive. And her specialty is astrochemistry. And her research aims to uncover how chemical processes affect the outcome of planet formation, especially the chemical habitability of nascent planets. So again, episode two, first guest, first interview, we're talking about the cosmos. We're starting off big before we go down smaller throughout the rest of the series. Why Why is that important that we're, we're starting off with this topic? Yeah. So you're right. Our first season, what we want to do is look at that order in in the universe and start the order in the physics uh, and in the chemistry and see how that leads to this order in the biology and evolution and how that leads to human consciousness and human right. flourishing. So you want to sort of trace this order throughout. Uh, so it's good to start at the very beginning and look at that underlying order in the physics and how it relates to chemical formation and planet yeah. formation and uh, um, as Karin will be able to talk about, uh, habitable planets. Yeah. And those are all... Co- all connected because again, yes, her specialty is as- astronomy, but there will be other aspects of science that come up as well. I'm sure. That's right. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, she uh, taught. We'll, we'll be able to ask her about you know the origins of life and uh, you know, whether there's life on other planets and what's the likelihood of that. How do we go about ident- uh, looking for that and those right. kinds of real interesting questions? Okay, she'll be here any moment joining us here at our DC studio. So I'll talk to you after that interview. Excellent. Dr. Karin Oberg, thank you so much for joining us here in our DC studio. Oh, it's really my pleasure to be here. I think our listeners can hear your beautiful Swedish accent. Can you tell us, summarize your journey from being to Sweden to Harvard, uh, working in astronomy? Well, that's a very charming way to ask about my origin story. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, so I grew up in Sweden and I lived there until like through high school. Uh, but during high school, I was starting to think about what I wanted to do. And I was starting to set my eyes on the U.S. and going to college there. And the only school that I knew about, because I thought I wanted to be an engineer, was MIT. But then my always helpful father told me that there was another school that was even more difficult to get into. And there was no way that I would be admitted <laughs> to Caltech. Uh, So, of course, I spent the next few years then doing everything I could to get admitted to Caltech. And semi-miraculously, I I was. Uh, So that's how I ended up on this side of the pond. Challenge accepted. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) He he knows his daughter. So, Uh, yes, I ended up uh, in the U.S. basically because of that challenge. And once at Caltech, I figured out within a couple of years that where my sort of special skills and interest collided uh, was in astrochemistry, so the combination of chemistry and astronomy. Mm-hmm. And once I figured that out, I was sort of on a path uh, towards uh, academia and uh, eventually that brought me into the Faculty of Astronomy at Harvard. That's incredible. Well, that's great. So, um, Karin, you, you said you ended up in astrochemistry, right? It, it seems like you know, uh, that's a, a, a field 
people probably aren't too familiar with. So um, if you want to just talk a little bit about your research, what you do, what, what do astrochemists do? And uh, I, I know the, you, you look at sort of the formation of solar systems and, and that, but if you can give a synopsis of what, what an astrochemist does. <laughs> sure. So I think uh, many people are more familiar with chemistry and how that is about deforming and destroying of molecules and thinking about what things are made of and down to sort of the molecular and even atomic level. So that's the chemistry part. And then astronomy is things that have to do with stars and planets and the universe as a whole. So what I do is I try to figure out what kind of molecules are present when stars and planets are forming and how that, that really impacts, especially what kind of planets you end up with, including potentially planets that are suitable for life, which is definitely a chemical question, whether you have the right sort of mm. molecules around for yeah. that. So what, what do you find? So you look at uh, planets as they're forming and so solar systems as they're forming and you're, what, what type of things are you looking for to be able to figure out, you know, how does this process play out? Right? Well, first of all, what you need is a really good telescope that allows you to gather the light from these sort of nascent solar systems that are hundreds of light years away. So we need really big telescopes and we need telescopes that can detect the kind of light that comes from specific uh, molecules. Uh, so a lot of the things we do is turning these sort of big radio telescopes towards these planet forming regions and then seeing, are there organic molecules there? Is there water there right where planets are forming? And based on that, then trying to figure out what will actually end up on planets. Okay. Yeah, so you know, it, it, you, if you look at um, you know the, the formation of planets and and and, and stars, right? yeah, that's uh, that that happens you know a little bit further along in the life of uh, you know our, our universe. So you know, we talked about your origin story. Let's let's go back to say the origin <laughs> of, of the universe here at the you know the the, the Big Bang theory and and uh, how do you go from that to the point where stars can form and where planets can form and what, what what's sort of the standard understanding of uh, that that our listeners could take away of how you get from point a to point b there yeah so that's a long li like <laughs> literally a long, a long, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a long story uh but if we think back to like sort of how far back in time that we can look uh in the universe uh it's very close to the beginning um so around 13.6 billion years ago or so, uh, we know that the universe is extremely dense and hot, no molecules, not even atoms. And then as the universe started to expand, it also started to cool down to a point where you could start getting first atoms and then later molecules. So you could sort of keep atoms together. And once you have molecules, uh, you can start uh, building up these sort of clouds of gas and later on in the uh, in the evolution of the universe, also dust, but initially just gas. And if that those gas clouds get massive enough, uh, they can start to collapse in on themselves due to gravity. And that's how you form the first stars. So the first stars actually formed fairly soon after the mm -hmm. Big Bang, but they were very different stars from the ones we have uh, today. So it um, took another sort of billion years or so before we have stars are exactly the, like the ones that are around today. And what's the lifetime of a star? Like the ones we see today? So that is a very good question. <laughs> and there's unfortunately not a single answer. So the wow. stars like our sun live for around 10 billion years. So very long. Smaller stars can live for 100 billion years. And the really big stars, the ones that uh, explode into supernovae, they sometimes only live for sort of 10 million years. So very brief in sort of the history of the universe. So <laughs> yeah. it depends if you're, if you're big, not very long at all. And if you're wow. small or longer than the lifetime of the universe. Incredible. So Karen, you, um, your research looks at the formation of, of, of planets. You've talked about uh, um, how you identify like uh, water and things sort of in planetary disks. Can you talk about just uh, how, how planets normally form? What's the process by which you get a solar system uh, to, to come into to being? Absolutely. So to talk about how planets form, we first have to spend a few seconds on how stars form, since planets really form as a byproduct right. of star formation. So stars form in a, in a galaxy when you get a cloud of dust and gas that becomes sort of massive enough that it starts collapsing in on itself just due to gravity. 
Uh, these clouds always have a little bit of spin or angular momentum that needs to be preserved. And the way that nature preserves that is by forming a disk of dust and gas around the young star. And it's in this disk that then planets form, first by dust coagulating to form bigger and bigger bodies, and then they can start to also accrete some of the gas, and that's how you end up with a Jupiter kind of planet that's, okay, that's yeah. mostly gas. And if you don't accrete that much gas, then you end up with something like an Earth-like planet, which is mainly, uh, mainly rock. Yeah. Now, is there um, a, uh, you know, in our solar system, we have these uh, rocky planets closer to the sun and the gaseous ones further away and larger. Is that a pattern that you see over and over again? Or is that unique? Yeah. It's a pattern we think we should see uh, mm. because we think the reason you have this very clear divide is that close to the sun, this dust was just like rock, like silicate. Yeah. And that's actually not that easy to stick together. Uh, once you get a little bit further away from the sun, it gets cold enough that this uh, dust has water ice on it. And you can start building up bigger sort of planet cores more quickly that can then accrete gas and form these giant, okay. giant planets. So we should see it uh, at other places. Um, we are maybe <laughs> seeing that when we are starting to really be able to gather the data to detect Jupiter and Saturn-like planets at the distances that they are at, but we don't have that much data yet. Uh, but the big surprise is that many planets around other, like many planets around other stars, so-called exoplanets uh, that are close in, actually don't look exactly like the Earth. Many of them look like tiny versions of Neptune oh, instead. Okay, interesting. Um, we're trying to figure out why that is. There are some good theories. Uh, so we don't always see sort of replicas of the solar system, uh, but sometimes we do also see the Earth-like planets uh, that are sitting close to their star. So it's not like we're unique. Like I guess we're somewhere somewhere in between, but being the sort of okay, most common yeah. outcome and being completely special. So did you say exoplanets are planets near the stars? Around other stars. Around other stars. Okay. And then this might be a very basic question, but how many planets do we know that exist out there? Great question. So we have observed a few thousand ones, but mm -hmm. these planets are not that easy to observe. So the fact that we have already seen a few thousand means that pretty much every star has a planet. So there are more planets than stars in the Milky Way. Wow. If you look at, um, say, the formation of uh, a, a solar system, right? Um, it, what is it that you know gives a, a solar system, say, a hospitable planets, right? What, what, what are we looking for? You mentioned water and sort of organic molecules is, is something that you see when you when you look at the formation of solar systems out out in the, in the sky. Um, but what, what is there something else that, that that that's key for a planet that might be able to sustain life like Earth as it forms? Well, the first thing is that you need a planet, right? So right. We, we think we need planets to, to have, have life on them. And it's actually not trivial how you form these planets in the first place. Mm -hmm. But let's say you, you manage to form a planet. You probably need it to be sort of roughly the size of the Earth because those are kind of planets that can have both dry land and oceans, which um, we think having both is probably important to, to get life going. And then you need to have that planet sitting at the right distance from its star so it can mm -hmm. sustain uh, liquid water. And well, the reason you're interested in that is that you actually want to have water around. So then the next thing is, do you have water? Um, and the reason you want to have water to have an origins of life is to have chemical reactions happening in that water. So sort of the fourth thing is, do you have the right kind of organic molecules around uh, to get sort of origins of life chemistry uh, going. So those would be sort of the four most basic ingredients that you need to have sort of a life-sustaining and life-originating planets. Yeah, and, and you can detect all of those through um, the, a telescopes looking at uh, different signals that, 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 that are yeah. emitted in the, in the light. Yeah, what's so cool, and this is really the past sort of decade or so, is that we now have the capabilities to find planets around other stars, so we know that they are common. So Criteria one <laughs> is there. Uh, we know there's also quite common to have sort of Earth-sized planets that are sitting at the right distance from their star. Mm -hmm. We're still sort of figuring out the precise number, but it's common enough that that's not going to be the bottleneck to having uh, sort of habitable planets. Water is one of our most common molecules in the universe. It seems like it's almost always present when planets are forming. 
And we're now also seeing that there are tons of organics in these planet forming regions. So it does seem like these like sort of four, four basic ingredients are actually fairly, fairly common. Uh, which is exciting. Yeah, that that is. So, I, I mean, obviously, that's those are ingredients that are necessary for life on on Earth, right? Is is there? Um, so we're making the assumption that if a life is uh, out there somewhere else in the in the, in the universe, it's going to be have some similarities to the way life is on Earth. Do you think there's? You know, are we missing other habitable planets because we're sort of Earth centric, right? We're thinking, oh, it's got to be water, and it's got to look like you know, in, in terms of, or, or are there sort of reason to assume that there's sort of a, a direction that uh, the underlying chemistry and physics is going to limit, you know, the the types of life and, and it's going to look similar to so what we have. So it's a both and okay. kind of answer. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely imagine chemistries that are not based on water, even that are not based on carbon that could form sort of big complex molecules, but it's not that easy. Uh, when we look at what sort of the universe produces sort of on its own, I said like water is one of the most abundant molecules. So of all the things we could think of having as a solvent where this chemistry could get going, water is by far the most abundant. Uh, so it's more based on actually what the universe sort of naturally produces. Most of the molecules that we find in space where plants are forming are organic molecules. So again, mm. it, it seems like of all the things you could choose, sort of life here on Earth chose the most abundant and sort of easy things to get this yeah. chemistry going. So I think it's a reasonable sort of starting point that you would go looking for other places that have had sort of a similar chemical trajectory using water and carbon as, as the basis. Yeah. Doesn't mean you should not follow up if you see something else that's interesting um, in, for example, cooler planets, we could have hydrocarbon solvents. But if I have limited telescope time, I'm going to focus, <laughs> focus on, on yeah. what I think is the what most you... likely one. And so it's not, not exactly based on what we find here on Earth, more based on sort of physics and chemistry, how we understand uh, how you can form really complex molecules the most yeah. readily in nature. That, that, that's interesting. You say you you want to look at what uh, the universe is going to naturally produce. That there's some sort of underlying <laughs> order in the universe that's going to produce water, or some of these organic chemical mo molecules, and so that's you, you know it's the universe is almost uh, in a sense uh, uh, poised to move in a, a certain direction. Mm -hmm. Do you see? It, it, is that sort of a view that you would? I, I know it's not, you know from a scientific <laughs> perspective, you don't want to talk. You know, you start talking about teleology and purpose. You you you, you um, back up. But from a personal perspective, you see, hey, there's a there's a, a underlying order and direction there that uh, you know you go from the, the Big Bang where you don't have any atoms, and and from that you you sort of the universe naturally on a, you know produces these things. So a slightly leading question. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean I think it's um, it's pretty clear that we live in a universe where sort of the laws of physics in some natural sense leads to chemistry, and a big, um, big open question uh, is whether the loss of chemistry in some sense naturally and often lead to biology. But at least from physics to chemistry, we can see that the kind of molecules that we sort of need for life are very readily produced, even with no sort of human uh, intervention. So mm -hmm. when I think we used to think about water as something like special about Earth and something that we were really excited if we found somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And now we just basically wherever we look, uh, we find it. And again, with organic chemistry, the same. Um, so, so yeah, so there's definitely uh, an order in the universe that is promoting chemistry that we would find interesting from an origins of life mm -hmm. point of view. Yeah. How would you respond to those in the scientific community and outside who posit, you know, no, the universe did not come into an existence from order, it came out of an existence out of nothing, and there isn't this kind of intentionality and, and purpose behind it. Well, so I think you can interpret these observations in different ways. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that there is order. I think it's difficult to argue uh, against. Mm -hmm. Now, the origin of that order, I think reasonable people can disagree or like have different ideas uh, where that came from. Uh, I think most people would actually probably not go as far as to argue that sort of order came out of disorder in some sort of orderly fashion, uh, but rather just say, well, this is just how it is. Like mm -hmm. if you have a universe, then you get 
some some sort of ordering or loss sort of as a part of having a universe and we don't know exactly where it came from and that's okay i mean i think mm -hmm. that's uh, probably where most um people would sort of stop and uh, i think i see no reason to stop there i think it is a perfectly <laughs> reasonable question to to ask yeah. if you recognize that there is order uh, to ask where that order came from and where that order is sort of going right. in sort of a forward-looking way uh, as well. <laughs> so in, in, in the Big Bang, it, is there uh, so, so these the the order of the the laws of physics, right? That 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 order is, is that that's there from the very beginning, um, and you know. In in terms of where and how that order is set, um, you know, people argue. Well, you know, we have to live in a order universe because you wouldn't have intelligent life if you you didn't have uh, order, right? So therefore, the fact that we have intelligent life <laughs> dictates that hey, there's going to be some order because you didn't have order in the universe. There 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 wouldn't um, be you and I and uh, mm -hmm. Catherine talking uh, today uh, <laughs> uh, about this. Do you think that, I mean, and, and, but that you know, doesn't necessarily answer the, the, the underlying sort of human question of uh, yeah. where does that order come from? And a lot of people often say, well, you know, uh, that order may have come from a multiverse. There's uh, these other theories, you know, that, 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 you know, the Big Bang wasn't the beginning of, 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 the, of all existence, but there, you know, the, there's uh, multiple universes. and. Do, do you think that helps, uh, uh, from a scientific standpoint, understand where the, the, the why the universe is ordered? Um, no, okay. uh, <laughs> but I think I mean I think there are multiple things that are baked into that question. I mean I think one approach among sort of physicists has been to be, well, we see order, but it seems to be in um, some sense sort of local orders. We have many different laws of physics and many different laws of chemistry. Is there a way to bring them all together? into some sort of like ultimate sort of origin order. And I would say that's that's trying to get a little bit closer to where does this order come from, but in some mm -hmm. sense just moves it back one step. Then I would say there's another approach, which is more sort of the multiverse approach, um, which can be either that, okay, you have an infinite number of universes and it's actually not super ordered what they are, but just randomly, some of them will look more ordered than others, and right. we could only live yeah. in one that was ordered. <laughs> so therefore, we are we That's perceive we order, even though it sort of comes from from randomness. But even that really just moves the question one step back. It doesn't actually answer the mm -hmm. question. It says, okay, the universe came out of the multiverse. It's a perfectly reasonable question to then right. ask. Okay, so where did the order of the multiverse come from, or where did this sort of multiverse structure come from? So, so I don't think it solves this from a sort of philosophical point of view, and at, at least at at the moment, it doesn't really change the scientific sort of laws and theories within our universe that's measurable, and therefore it doesn't really resolve anything from a scientific point of view uh, as well. Yeah, great. You know, we have you know the current understanding mm -hmm. of the universe is fourteen billion years old and you know it, it, it originated in this singularity and in this uh, uh event the uh, what um are sort of the big questions that 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 we're still trying to understand about how the universe got to the point that it did today what if you, if you just say hey what's the <laughs> biggest unanswered question that you know that 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 we're still trying to wrap uh uncover you know? yeah so, so i guess first just sort of clarification so i mean we can't answer with science sort of what the very beginning of the universe was. When when right. science sort of gets started, we're pretty close to it, yeah. but we're not actually back at the very, very origin. So sort of physics and science sort of steps in when there's already something there. Yeah. Uh, but um, we have an overall model of what happened. I think everyone would feel pretty comfortable saying it's scientific truth, like mm. that we had something like the Big Bang that's part of what our universe is like. Exactly how the very beginning of the big, or like close to the beginning of the Big Bang, how that unfolded is not resolved. Uh, there are th so-called inflation theories, uh, which try to resolve some sort of big questions about the universe uniformity and exactly the physics there is unclear. Uh, the universe today is mainly made up out of dark energy and dark matter. They're called dark because we can't see them and don't know what they are. I was about to ask. Well, it sounds evil. It sounds troubling. No, it's, it was just ignorance rather yes. than malice yeah. is how you should okay. interpret yeah. that, that darkness. Uh, and uh, we know that the, these have a 
big impact on how the universe evolved. That's how we can know that they're there. We can infer them from that sort of normal matter is not sufficient mm. to explain the structure of the universe. Uh, but exactly what they are, we don't know. And, and this is more than 90% of the universe is this dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. So we're actually pretty far from, I would say, a complete understanding of the universe. A question that comes to my mind is just you, I mean, you study the galaxies, you're, and we're talking about so much that is still unknown. Is that just humbling? What is that like to, to realize the enormity of it all? Uh, well, I think it's a dangerous Thing to claim that you're a humble person <laughs> that sort of defeats the purpose <laughs> good call there uh so i mean what i study is a bit closer to home mm. like things that are only a few hundred light years away and we are looking at things that are a bit more tangible sort of planets and stars yeah. and rather than these really distant uh sort of structural cosmological questions uh but even that sort of puts some other things in perspective I think is yeah. uh, maybe a, a less um, spiritually dangerous way <laughs> of, of putting it. That I I yeah. do think that you, you do get sort of a daily dose of sort of really zooming out mm -hmm. and thinking about what the universe is like. Uh, not just that we are small, but that our solar system is small and it's only one of many. And right. uh, that I think allows you to um, yet yeah, take some things not too seriously that otherwise you might be tempted to take yeah. very seriously. Because just to clarify, the theory of multiverse, that's m multiple universes happening simultaneously. That's right, okay. which is a little bit of an oxymoron. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it, it, it's really interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about your, your, your research and, and, and trying to you know, pinpoint what these things are in these planetary forming disks as, as planets are, are forming. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the... You know, limitations is what are you able to see and what 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 can you pick from that and so we have uh, this new james webb telescope that uh, mm -hmm. you're involved with can you talk a little bit about that what hey, what what do you hope to for your research you know or okay. just for research in general what what are we hopeful to get from that and, and what is it and, and sort of what so what, it's what? a beautiful telescope <laughs> to start with <laughs> uh which um it's working so well. I mean, we are less mm -hmm. than a, a year into the James, James Webb Space Telescope uh, actually giving us scientific data. And I just continue to be amazed at just the quality uh, and beauty of, um, of the observations that are coming in. But the way that I am using it um, is to really look at water and organics in the innermost regions of the so-called protoplanetary disks. So these are the disks of dust and gas around young stars where planets form. The innermost regions of these disks is where Earth-like planets form. So we are really interested in trying to understand what is the exact water and organic content, like right where mm -hmm. these Earth-like planets are sort of coming, coming together or assembling. And that's something that the James Webb Telescope is just very good uh, at doing. So we have some preliminary data. It's looking very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, it is indeed showing some water. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things that that I'm using it for. And this telescope, I've seen a lot of talk about the James Webb Telescope. Can you even just further clarify why this is such a significant, lovely telescope? As <laughs> as you've said, it is a lovely telescope. <laughs> uh, so generally, when you're thinking about how, what kind of astronomy you can do with a telescope. It's just the bigger it is, the better. You can gather more photons, more light, if you have a bigger telescope. So compared to Hubble, the James Webb Telescope is just an order of magnitude bigger in terms of how many okay. photons it can collect. So that really helps. But then what's especially good for the kind of research I want to do is that the James Webb Space Telescope doesn't actually take pictures in sort of normal optical light that we can see with our eyes, but rather longer wavelengths, so infrared wavelengths. And that's really great because that's where a lot of molecules emit a lot of their light, especially mm -hmm. water has tons of so-called spectral lines in this infrared region. So it allows us to really pick up these unique signatures of different molecules, which we could not do with something like Hubble. Awesome. Yeah. So you're looking, um, as you mentioned before, sort of the criteria that you, you have for uh, these are you know, uh, possibly hospitable uh, planets or, uh, that are forming. And so... You're saying that, that you're um, like there's a lot of those in 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 the 
in the universe, right? So what is your, so just having a, 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 a planet that's possibly hospitable to life is obviously quite different than having a planet with, with, with life on it, right? So what is your thought on, um, you know, whether um, life is going to be uh, found on other hmm. planets or, or other uh, places in our, our universe? It, it, what's the frequency? So if I, uh, the, based on your research, your gut, your... <laughs> Yes, I'm going to ignore the word frequency because okay. that <laughs> assumes that there's any kind of quantitative right, uh, right. prediction, which I do not have. I think, that, uh, first of all, it's important to distinguish between life being present and will we find it. Uh, so even if life is present on the most nearby potentially habitable planet in our galaxy, we could not find it today. Like it's just really mm. difficult or we would have to get really lucky to find it in a sort of an unambiguous way. It's just really difficult to find the signatures of life on other planets because they're so far away. So you, we probably, JWST will get us a little bit closer, but we are going to need uh, another even bigger telescope uh, to go for that. Um, so is it present? So thinking more about is it present or not? I would guess yes. Uh, it is an opinion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is not a prediction. Uh, so, but what do I base this on? I think it's a reasonable. I'm going to assume that's going to be your follow-up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it seems like here on Earth, the only planet where we know for sure that there is life, that life originated pretty quickly. That mm. is, um, that suggests that um, it's a fairly sort of easy process in some sense uh, to occur even though it seems like it shouldn't. With the right planet and With the, the right, right factors, then life could easily happen. That's what the data on Earth suggests in terms okay. of just how, how quickly uh, life came into existence uh, here on Earth. Uh, so if we, if we think that that's sort of a reasonable way to, to reason, and then we then think about, okay, so how often do we have planets that are similar enough to Earth that... It, the same thing should happen there. And that's where the astronomy comes in and is telling us that those planets seem to be quite common. Mm -hmm. So if we bring those two things together, uh, it would seem that then life uh, is quite common uh, in the galaxy. And I'm purposefully using yeah. a vague qualitative <laughs> term, yeah. uh, but sort of common enough, I would think that with the right kind of telescope, it should be possible to discover. Yeah. And, and, and the chemistry of life, right? So, you know, the, it seems to be a, you know, it's a, a big field to try to understand the origin of life and, and the and chemistry. And there's a lot that obviously we don't even know about, you know, uh, what happened here on Earth. And, you know, to, to follow up on what you're saying, you know, it's thought that about four billion years ago, the Earth was maybe hospitable after, mm -hmm. you know, it had been bombarded by asteroids before that and meteors. And so mm -hmm. up, up until then, you really couldn't have life uh, emerge on, on planet Earth. Uh, but then you start to see signs of life, you know, within, you know, uh, you know by 3.5 billion years. So there's some debate about, you know, uh, it, it's interesting, these debates they have, you know, whether it is a sign of life, whether it isn't and, hmm. and, and so forth. But um, that would indicate that it didn't take, you know, billions of years on Earth to, to, to get life to form, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, do you think, similar to what you see in cosmic evolution, where there's sort of a, a, an underlying order that drives the formation of molecules and water, like you said, it, it would seem that, do, do, you, do you, it's a research that, that you would point to, or th that there's an underlying order that drives molecules to take on, you know, to form cellular properties, right? Yeah. Or, or, or life, right? You know, is there some life... Uh, written into the chemistry, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's an important caveat that we don't know how this process unfolded here on Earth. Yeah. There are some good theories, right. and there's some really good research happening right now trying to figure out how chemistry could turn into to biology, but it's not mm -hmm. the solved problem. Um, but given that this is a natural process, yeah. and I'm going to assume that that is <laughs> true, um, then we have sort of a a dilemma, which is that if we look at the simplest life uh, here on Earth, it's chemically incredibly complex and complicated. And thinking about how that could happen in sort of a random way, uh, 
it's it's difficult to to imagine how that could happen. And it definitely could not happen if it was a truly random process where you just had sort of atoms randomly sort of bouncing into yeah, one right, another. Yeah. You would not form DNA or RNA, but that kind of sort of random process. So what it's telling us is that if we think that this is a natural process, then there must be something in the laws of chemistry that is moving chemistry under the right condition towards biology, towards sort of the hmm. right kind of molecules. That doesn't mean that it's um, sort of a miraculous process or anything yeah, right. like that, or that there is like some intention, like as we think about it, we have an intention yeah. in the chemistry, but rather that there are sort of chemical reactions because of the laws of chemistry that are preferred, and that those are in some sense the right ones uh, to eventually get you to biology. Yeah, and it's interesting when you talk about like the organic <laughs> molecules that you find that are abundant in the universe when you look out some of those are molecules that we find uh, amino acids for example you find them that's right all over and th those mm -hmm. are uh, what are used to make up proteins and and one of the fundamental building blocks of, of cells and yeah and, and, and there are other things that 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 you sh that suggest that, that, that some of these things are yeah i mean i think there are some pretty cool experiments for trying to mimic what the young earth was was like uh so mm -hmm think four billion years ago right, as it was yeah. starting to become habitable, which shows that if you have some very basic organic molecules around, something like hydrogen cyanide, a uh, little bit of sulfur kind of molecules, and then just water and UV light, you end up forming a lot of the building blocks of modern life. So not just amino acids, but yeah. also the building blocks of RNA. Right. Uh, oh. And that's, that's really exciting that it seems like that actually, at least that first step going from very basic organic chemistry to true building blocks of life happens quite readily. Um, and then it's, and there are other experiments that show that once you have these building blocks, you can start put together like these some smaller strands uh, of things that we would recognize as sort of informative molecules, something sort of similar uh, to RNA. So, so there is sort of promising experiments uh, showing that that kind of thing is possible. Mm, yeah, let's say. And, and one of the things I, I think it's interesting is that a lot of times people think, oh, you know, the simplest cells have 400 genes. So that's such a huge amount of complexity. How do you go from one to the, you know, was there, is there, is there anything simpler? And, and you know, there probably, there, there must have been, yes. there must have been, and, yeah. and that those things don't survive because they get outcompeted by these, that's you right. know, once you have a, a really well-functioning cell, any simpler thing that that is going to go by the wayside and and so we don't have a nice record of oh well, step a b c and d which makes the job of you know origin of life chemists uh, more difficult to try to figure out how things i know we have an upcoming episode we've been preparing for with uh, dan will be interviewing dr simon conway morris and he has a different theory on this though doesn't he yeah he i mean his idea is that uh you know uh, that, that the it'd be rare that for life to uh, emerge but if it does he thinks then you know the the evolution of of life to produce something like uh, an intelligent uh, rational creature like uh, um, like humans is almost inevitable but but that first step he thinks is almost a a singular you know, sort of a singularity very rare um a, a, a occurrence um it's uh, uh, so so I, mean, so I think that, I mean, that's a reasonable theory, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's obvious from the Earth's record mm -hmm. that that is correct. And again, I mean, I'm going to put sort of thinking about Morris as an astronomer rather than sort of as a biologist. Right. Uh, if you again look at time scales here on Earth, it seemed so, so just like to rehearse the record around 3.5 billion years ago, pretty much everyone agrees that there are life is around. The oldest evidence go back towards sort of 3.8 billion years ago. Um, and we think the Earth became habitable around 4.1 billion years ago. Okay. Um, so the time between it's possible to have life to where life seems to be everywhere, otherwise we wouldn't see any record of it, mm -hmm. it's actually very, it's less than 300 million years. On the other hand, the time that it took between that first life and having even animal life mm -hmm. is three billion years. Uh, so if we're thinking just from sort of time scales, which one was easier and which one was more difficult, it is not obvious that going from sort of single cell to animal is um, something that you will see more often uh, than this sort of initial step going from chemistry 
to biology just based on these sort of time yeah, scales. Yeah, that's interesting. The, so what would your thought be on it? So, so suppose life does emerge <laughs> readily in a lot of plants. Do you think it's it's uh, uh, almost inevitable that it's going to evolve into you know something much more complex and eventually something that's capable of the, the, the UFOs. Build, buildings <laughs> that, that, that we have? Or is it, uh, would you, uh, again, this is obviously speculative, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, would you think it, uh, you know, it might emerge a lot and then just be, go extinct you know, very quickly, be wiped off the, these habitable planets and be very unstable? Well, as again, so you're talking to an astronomer yeah, rather than yeah, an evolutionary yeah, yeah. biologist. <laughs> I will, uh, this I'm speaking as a laywoman rather than as yeah. an expert. But again, looking at the time scales, it seems like on Earth that it is it was not inevitable that we went from single cell to, to animal life. But once you made that transition to animal life, then it seems almost inevitable or this was very rapid that you ended mm. up getting very complex and intelligent uh, animals. That was fairly fast. Now we're, we're again talking about time scales that are more sort of hundreds of millions of years rather than billions of years. So again, just looking at our own record, it seems like the big bottleneck was getting that first animal life, not really the origins of life or the evolution after you have uh, animal life. Yeah. Um, so I think it is very possible that you will have planets where you just have bacterial life, where you, where you don't go any further. Go any that, further. Yeah. Um, Especially since we can consider that many stars don't live for as long uh, mm. as our sun does. So if our sun had only lived for three and a half billion years instead of nine billion years, we would never yeah, right. have gotten to <laughs> intelligent animals, right? Uh, so, but I, my guess would be that there will be still uh, a good number of other planets where you will also get to animal life, uh, even if it's not all of them. Uh, and there it seems like you then you do um, evolve sort of intelligence independently here on Earth in sort of multiple, multiple kinds of species. Yeah, right. And that really suggests to me there here, I think I'm in agreement uh, yeah. with uh, that, that you do. Uh, you do then, if you get to animals, you do get to intelligent yeah, animals. Almost mm -hmm. once you cross a certain threshold. Yeah. There's, um, yeah it's interesting, you know, everybody's making these, you know, it, it, he is, you are, mm -hmm. I do, mm -hmm. on uh, an N of one. So we have one <laughs> example, to, <laughs> but but that's what we have. And so you have to try to make intelligent sort of predictions of, yeah. off of that. So, um, But it does seem like you, you um, of the opinion or think that the universe might be teeming with life, right? And mm -hmm. does that, do you think, does that change the way you look at the universe, its direction, maybe its purpose, or, or, or what the meaning of the uh, of the universe, or, or mm -hmm. do you have a different meaning? Uh, do you look at the universe different if you think uh, we're the only things here uh, in the entire universe that that's alive? Does that you know change the way you view yourself, the humans, the the universe in general? So I think the universe is deeply meaningful, even if we are the only ones who find meaning. Okay. Mm. Like I don't. I don't think we need another. Like I don't think we need a universe to sort of be teeming with life, uh, to have the universe sort of being ordered towards life. I mean, it yeah. sounds like it's an, it's enough uh, that that we exist. But it just seems like a more beautiful and fun <laughs> universe uh, if there is life on many other planets as well, uh, and. Uh, it it's it would seem strange to me like seeing how wherever we look else in the universe like it seems like the same laws physics and chemistry right. uh, apply um, if those had not if those unfolding in sort of in other places had also not then and then resulted in loss of biology uh, mm -hmm. emerging uh, that that would seem a bit strange to me i mean not just that look removing meaning but i think that to me seems something more than natural conclusion from looking what we have here uh and i would need some good good reason Isn't, why not to yeah, expect yeah. that yeah. uh given again sort of that seems like here on earth it was not that difficult for our planet to become one that was teeming with life yeah yeah uh, but but i think the where it maybe starts or really affecting like how we see ourselves, it's not, I think, 
Martian bacteria are not really going to change how we see ourselves. Yeah, right. It would be yeah. super yeah. cool. Yeah, we should right. definitely yeah. go looking for that. Uh, I mean, th that's something that would really give us that instead of N of 1, N of 2 right. is much yeah. more constraining <laughs> in, when it comes to origins of life um, and therefore understanding our own origins. But where I think that it would lead to some maybe reevaluation of how we see ourselves and what our role in the universe is, is if we find alien life that is in some fundamental way similar to us, that can have these mm -hmm. kind of conversations, right. that can sort of ponder the meaning uh, of the universe. And that's a very different, I think, question compared to just, is there is there extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial life? life? Yeah, no, I think when people talk about extraterrestrial life, they jump right to that. They yes. don't start <laughs> imagining bacteria on other planets. They don't really <laughs> seem to care. Which is interesting because- but you, they're you, really cool. They you, should yeah, care. No, no, I, I agree. <laughs> I just, it, it Yay, bacteria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how um, you know the 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 people look at uh, say evolution and the amount of creatures that, that has been able to produce and how that is the the beauty in that um, that view of, of 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 seeing how many organisms much more than if the Earth was static and you can only have one set of organisms on it ever you know that 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 uh, extra creative ability of the of, of of the Earth it sort of parallels what you're talking about the extra creative ability of the universe if you could have life being created in multiple places it seems to resonate the, 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 to some extent with the, with that sort of evolutionary view, which is interesting, yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, tying back to some of the things we were talking about before, if we think that there is sort of a built-in sort of directionality in chemistry towards biology, I mean, we should expect that to then play out more in other once. places yeah. more than <laughs> once as well. Yeah, I agree. I'd, I'd love to ask, if you don't mind, some kind of personal questions while we have you here. You know, I understand throughout your journey and being the scientist that you are, you went through a phase where you were agnostic and um, eventually converted and entered into the Catholic Church. Can you just, do you mind kind of summarizing that journey that really paralleled with your journey as a scientist? I'm happy to. And, and I think in some sense, the way that I have approached sort of metaphysical question is, questions is not too different from the way that I approach um, questions that have to do with the material order and sort of the scientific approach. Um, so I mean, something that I became convinced of as a teenager, as an mm. agnostic teenager, mm -hmm. and then became more consciously convinced of as an agnostic college student, um, is that on the one hand, I have free will, mm. like this is a real thing and any sort of theory of the universe that tells me that doesn't exist. Uh, what to me be kind <laughs> yeah. of similar to a theory of the universe that tells me that gravity doesn't exist. This is yeah. just something that I know to be true. Mm -hmm. And how I live out my life sort of in every minute is sort of a witness to that I hold this to be true. Um, and, then, uh, and then the second thing is that there are things that are truly good and things that are truly evil. Like mm -hmm. there's a realism to morality that doesn't depend on a majority view or uh, sort of culture or like even if 99% or even 100% of people uh, voted to say that, you know, murder is sometimes good, it would still be an evil. Mm. And, yeah. and again, yeah. I believe that I and everyone I know, whether they hold that to be true or not, live as if that is true. <laughs> and uh, uh, assenting to those two truths, um, it's difficult to hold a completely sort of materialistic worldview. I think that it might be possible. I know there are people that try, but I have not found one that I sort of <laughs> mm -hmm. found convincing. Mm -hmm. So, so those, so holding those sort of like very basic truths and sort of being conscious about those, um, I think led me as um, sort of an older college student. Uh, to start wearing uh, my confirmation cross. Mm -hmm. I was baptized and confirmed in the Lutheran church, but okay. left the church uh, as I became conscious about Christian beliefs around my <laughs> confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, not, not to signal that I was Christian, but to signal that I was not a materialist or an atheist. I mean, if I tried mm -hmm. to sort of analyze what I was doing with it, it was for sure not uh, sort of a conscious Christian wow. one, but it was a, I'm not on that team kind of thing. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, in, during my first year of graduate school, after reading a couple of other C.S. Lewis books, mm -hmm. I ended up ordering Mere Christianity, 
which I think is telling you that I already was <laughs> wanting, in some sense, something like Christianity yeah. to be true, or I wouldn't have ordered a book with a title, yeah. Mere Christianity. Uh, but I actually don't recall exactly what my thought process was, but I, I did order the book. And I read it in pretty much a single sitting, except that I remember being walking around most of the time because as I was reading it, I was realizing that I believed that it was true. <laughs> and that's a very yeah. unsettling thing to have happening within sort of a couple of hours that um, this whole Christianity thing, I think I'm assenting to it's it. A, and <laughs> what does that mean? And how does that change things? Right. Well, I'm just thinking with the mind that you've been gifted with as a scientist, as someone who analyzes the fact yeah. that you're analyzing yourself as you're going through this, this yes. process as well. Yeah, and as I was convicted by the arguments, both the ones that are sort of explicit in C.S. Lewis, and I would say some of the ones that are implicit uh, as well. Um, and at the time, I thought it was a purely rational sort of discourse kind of conversion. Looking back, I mean, I think part of it like, was that I was completely open to it by the time I was opening that book. Yeah. In some sense, I think you have to have some desire mm -hmm. for it to be true, to be open to that kind of arguments. Mm -hmm. I ended up giving the book to a couple of other people thinking they would just become Christian too, and yeah. they didn't. They so didn't. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a pure, pure reason thing. It's also, I think, a desire of the, of the heart. But yeah, so by the end of reading the book, I was like, well, I guess I'm Christian now, um, and I don't really know how to do that, but I know you're supposed to go to church. <laughs> so I Googled English-speaking churches. I was in the Netherlands at the time for my PhD, and the closest one that sounded reasonable to me was the Anglican Church uh, in The Hague. So I ended up being a parishioner there for the next three and a half years. Wow. No, I, I saw in another interview that you did, I think that you read Lord of the Rings every single year for 10 years as True. well. It seems like literature also had a hand in, in how you thought about these bigger questions. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think that and also being raised with a very strong sense of morality. So in some sense, recognizing the realism of morality yeah, right. were two things that really prepped uh, the way. And I would say Lord of the Rings, I think it did prepare me for Christianity. It probably prepared me even more specifically for Catholic uh, Christianity <laughs> and the sense of you know, the importance of the material word, the sort of adventure, the uh, and other things that think come, come up in Lord of the Rings. Uh, but what really brought me into the Catholic Church was was another Englishman, uh, Chesterton. So I read him pretty soon after Mere Christianity. and You got the trifecta there. Yeah, I did. I did. And Chesterton got them all. <laughs> uh, I read yeah, yeah New Newman a little bit later. Okay, but, uh, but, but yeah, Chesterton, reading Orthodoxy, um, was a somewhat similar experience mm. to reading Mere Christianity in that I immediately recognized that this was the kind of Christianity that I was hmm. assenting to all all along, but it wasn't as emotionally fraught as the as the first one because going from agnostic to Christian is right, a bigger that's step. a bigger jump. <laughs> uh, as I then started to try to live out as a Christian and as a Catholic uh, scientist, I mean, one of the th things I started seeing was also sort of the signs of creation in the material uh, order. But for me, at least, it came the other way around. At first, I sort of had, I think, a Christian or Catholic mindset. Yeah. And then that allowed allowed me, it sort of opened up space for me, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to see the universe uh, for what it's really like and to actually start asking some of these questions of where does the order come from? How does that fit in mm. to sort of a Christian or this yeah. theistic understanding uh, or what the universe is really like and what it's there for. Yeah, it seems to open up new ways of looking at things or new questions to ask that you take uh, a, a, a different perspective on when you when, when you have that, you see it in a different way when, yeah. That's right. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, this is episode two. You're really kicking us off and, and helping paint the picture um, of the universe and of the galaxies. And throughout this season, we're going to work our way down to biological evolution, to consciousness, to human flourishing. Any other just final thoughts that you can share on this topic? I mean, I think what is beautiful about sort of a theistic framework, or even Christian or Catholic framework, 
is that these different topics really do fit together. I mean, I, I think it's one of the, I think sort of weaknesses of sort of contemporary university or sort of contemporary academic life is that we really try to compartmentalize these different questions or even say that some questions are outside yeah. of what you can ask. But these are, I mean, when we're talking about either the human person or creation, first of all, these are natural questions that are totally legit mm. uh, to ask, and they do fit together. I mean, the, the wonder sort of of humanity and consciousness um, is in some sense, I think, increased when we see the kind of sort of physical evolution that had to happen first, and sort of the enormity of the cosmos that yeah. was required to bring for, forth life and then bring forth uh, sort of conscious uh, creatures that are uh, like ourselves. And I think it does sort of really, uh, really allow us to focus both how unlikely it feels that creatures mm -hmm. like us could come into existence, right. but then also how well ordered the universe must be for that to actually uh, actually happen. Oh, absolutely. Well, Dr. Karen Oberg, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. You know, this interview, speaking with you really was out of this world, <laughs> and that pun is intended. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's great having you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I learned I learned so much. That was so fascinating. What stood out to you? Yeah, I, I think I, I, what stood out, I think, that was the last uh, thing she was saying. You know, I, I think that that sums up sort of why we wanted to have her on. And she talked about the, you know, the the limitations of sort of the modern university where knowledge is sort of siloed, and there are certain questions that are off limits. And you know, the questions about well, you know uh, the, the the meaning of life, the purpose of the universe, right. is there direction? You know, is there an, a source of this order? Those type of things that are real questions that people are interested in um, talking about and thinking about. They're often walled off. Oh, it's not a scientific hmm. question. We can't talk about it. So it's nice to have a scientist who's interested in those type of questions yeah. that wants to uh, dis discuss those and wants to you know see these meta questions at the intersection of science, theology, and philosophy. So that. You know that that's uh, you know the reason we wanted her on. Yeah, you know? she's not afraid to ask those big questions. Um, it, what really stood out to me too was just obviously this very. She's so impressive. You know, I again, she's at Harvard. She is this highly esteemed scientist, and she's so down to earth. And and I was so open just in sharing her own personal journey as well. I was really edified and appreciated that. Um, there were a few other things I, I wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Again, me being a non scientist, there was this talk about organic molecules. What is what is meant by that? Yeah, so organic molecules, they get the name organic because initially these are molecules, mostly uh, carbon-based molecules okay. that um, initially people thought were only in living organisms, so they got classified as organic molecules, like or, you know, for, for being associated with life. But we also, we, we know now that they're found not only in living organisms, but as, as Karen was talking about, they can form um, sort of uh, from the sort of chemistry of the universe. So you can find organic molecules uh, that aren't uh, associated with life, but the name still is still there. But you okay. know, to, to to have uh, life emerge, you, you're going to need these organic molecules to form, um, sort of uh, before the biology gets going. Right. You know, there were there were so many things that that we covered in that conversation, and even what I thought was interesting was the timeline of here on Earth of how life really develops from. And you can say this way mm -hmm. more articulately than I can, but simple organisms to complex and it happens pretty quickly yeah so what she was pointing out is that what happens seems to have happened quickly is the 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 origin of life on on on, on earth uh, in a couple hundred million years uh, but uh, you know by 3.5 billion years ago you have uh, the uh, single cell life on uh, on earth and it takes billions of years before you get to multicellular life um, and so um, I think her point was that it, it takes a long time to move up that next step of the ladder. Like it seems mm -hmm. like there's something in the chemistry that might make the formation of biology mm -hmm. uh, more uh, rapid than once you have a single cell, um, that it takes a long time to get to multicellular organisms, which is, which is interesting. But also what's interesting though is that um, 
you know, multicellular organisms have emerged more than once. So this going from single cell to multicellular, uh, it might have taken a long time, but it seems to be convergent that it, it emerged more than more than once, which is yeah. which is interesting. So it's uh, you know, you're, you're, again as we, we talked about in the, in, the, in in her interview, it's right. an N of one. We only have one example mm -hmm. of how it actually played out here uh, on Earth, and you know, if we see life emerge on another planet and see it might might run a different time course. Um, which is which is interesting. It, it was I love just hearing the conversation between an astronomer and a biologist <laughs> as well, and biology came up too. Yeah, you know, one of the things I, I mean, the, the points that she she was making is how the physics drives the formation of the chemistry, right? So, um, out of the physics of the universe, you start to produce, you know, uh, uh, different atoms, and those atoms form in a certain abundance, right? And then, because they form in a certain abundance, you form certain molecules uh, the chemistry comes naturally out of the, mm -hmm. the of the physics um, and then you know so now uh, the the idea in, in her research is looking for these chemicals that out of the, these chemicals like water and certain organics that the biology would would flow out of right so uh, the chemistry naturally gives rise to mm -hmm. to the biology so there's some um, structure in the physics and order in the physics that gives rise to the chemistry we have in our universe and right. there's some structure and order in the chemistry that's going to give rise to the biology that we have in our universe and maybe that's what helped uh, move from the chemistry to the biology in only a couple hundred million years here here on earth you know so so one example just to bring that home is yeah. like um, so so how would the, say the chemistry lead to the biology mm -hmm. uh, you know there's a lot of research on you know if you, if you look at cells they all have membranes right there's so you know there, there's the the border that keeps the cell uh, yeah. de defines the limits of the cell that's um, made of these molecules that are fats lipids right um, and so to have a biology to have a cell you have to have a, a membrane really to, okay. to, to, to protect it right uh, but if you put lipids into water as most of us know right lipids don't like to, they, they, they keep separate from water so if you take these lipids that make up uh, you know cell membranes and put them into water they spontaneously form membranes because they try to get away from the water so there's an example of how the chemistry where you know we all know oils and water doesn't mix they've right. got to stay away the, the the oils or the lipids that make up cell membranes naturally form um, so of membranes uh, uh, because of that's what they chemically want to do so wow. th that's it you know one minor example of yeah. how maybe you know the chemistry is pushing things towards life yeah that's so interesting is there anything else that you specifically wanted to react to or that stood out to you yeah i mean it's just uh, interesting how little uh we know of yeah. the 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 universe in terms of planetary formation how we're just sort of in our infancy seeing and trying to you know as, as Karen was saying mm -hmm. uh, describe how many planets there are and what the type of planets what what patterns should we see in planetary formation um it, it, it's really interesting i'm looking forward to you know seeing this field advance but right. particularly with the new telescope uh, and be able to get better data to be able to get a better understanding yeah. of how you know planetary disks form and a lot of excitement over the james webb telescope yeah, there definitely. i can tell yeah no, that, that was fascinating. And at this point, I'd love to transition over to the office hours. Ask me anything. Um, my first question I have for you, episode two, is actually still on this theme of the cosmos and galaxies and, and space. Um, there Earlier this year, NASA announced that the astronauts who will helm the first crewed moon mission in five decades, the crew will include the first woman and the first person of color to go to the moon. It's for Artemis two. So there's a lot of build up leading to this launch that's going to take off November 2024. And as we're, okay, ha knowing that's in mind and seeing more come out in the news ahead of Artemis 2, and here we are speaking with an astronomer today, thinking about space, how do you think about space exploration as a biologist? Basically, you know, my question for you is, do space missions like Artemis 2, does that advance our understanding of biology and, and, and how so? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it really does. We, we, you know, our form, our, our, our biology evolved to deal with an environment that has gravity. So you know, what happens to this well-evolved animal when you put it in an environment where there is no gravity or where there is less gravity? And how does that change? You know, we learned that when you know, you're in a zero gravity environment, your bones get thinner because they don't have as much pressure. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting things about how well 
<laughs> you know, the human body respond to yeah. zero gravity environments or low gravity environments. And um, how do cells, you know, you know, culture cells in space, you know, do, do they change their behavior when you change the, 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 the their environment? Um, and do they change it? Do they divide faster? Do they divide slower? Do they differentiate in different ways? So right. there's a lot of interesting questions as you change the environment because cells and organisms have evolved to deal with one in particular, you know, the environment that they yeah. uh, originated in. When you move them out, how do they respond? You know, and that's an interesting Interesting, I think, question. Yeah, no, no, definitely a lot of excitement ahead of yeah. that yeah. November 2024. So there's still some time. Yeah. Um, okay, my my second question for you has to do with AI. Oh, you goodness. and I have had yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some private conversations <laughs> yeah. about AI. It's in the news everywhere, you know, right now from chat GPT to concerns over whether AI will replace television writers, for example, right. yeah. um, and on and on. And so I'm curious on your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're a scientist. You're also, you're a professor. And there are concerns about how AI may impact education. What are your thoughts? Um, are you fearful over it? Are there any benefits of AI? Yeah, I, I think uh, we're gonna replace all professors with robots that can just, you know, get that lecture out with no <laughs> hiccups, you know, I think so. I, I, I'm gonna be out of a job here. No. <laughs> I <don't> um, so. <laughs> but I, I think the, the the pressing issue that I already see in talking to colleagues is, okay, um, how do you give students real assignments where they can't just go and type in chat GPT and turn back in a paper that's uh, written by uh, chat GPT. But I think yeah. that, that, that forces us to, Think about the type of assignments you're giving students and what are you trying to get out of them? Is this just a busy work? Tell me, you know, what's the plot of Shakespeare? What What is this? Hmm. Uh, you know, um, well, uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, um, you know, what are eukaryotic cells and how, you know, something very simple. Like we have to ask more probing uh, questions that require sort of critical thinking and analysis. It's something that the AI isn't good at yeah. as good at yet it know. can't just be memorization yeah. and then regurgitate it out right. on a page there yeah. has to be like you said that that yeah. critical thinking aspect which ai cannot do no, it is not us. as yeah i can't right. uh, and that's where you know if uh, as a professor i'm just spitting out information in my class you know i'll be replaced by ai then it's cheaper you know i don't complain ai doesn't complain as much they don't ask Maybe for if you want a day off raise. you yeah. can have your yeah. ai but, but you you yeah. you, you got to think okay what am i bringing and yeah and, and i think that the the human connection you know which is what you know, a university was that you had a relationship with your professor. They they knew who you were. You know that that type of uh, learning that that we that that fosters community, a community of learners, right? Of yeah. people that are uh, striving to learn. That's what you know. Uh, we've got a more return to uh, a, as a university where uh, that one on one interactions, which is what often is the most. Um, influential aspect of, of learning yeah. and, and, it, and it was in my life in terms of it's why i went into science was a professor who took interest in me talked to me you know that you know changed my life and those yeah. are the type of things that chat gpt is not going to do and that's what you want uh, out of education yeah. you know i think it'll maybe there's a way it can challenge right. us all to be our best versions right. of yeah. ourselves yeah. well that's that's a wrap for yeah. episode two. Again, our first interview, yeah. our first guest. And, and I want to let, again, our viewers and listeners know if you were as just fascinated by that conversation as we were, so much content on the Maja Center website. Dr. Karin Oberg has some great videos there as well. So I want to encourage people, look at our show notes. We have some helpful links for you. But go to the Maja Center website if you're interested in more content there as well. And then next episode... I think you're going to be excited about. We have Dr. Simon Conway Morris, who's yeah. a, a paleobiologist, um, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, convergence and uh, biological evolution. So I'm looking forward yeah. to uh, that uh, next episode. Yeah, no, excellent. So make sure to subscribe so that you get alerted when that episode is dropped. And give us a five-star review if you don't mind, because that helps more people find our podcast as well. Until then, we'll see you next time. <laughs>